This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everybody. This is Lonnie Reed. Um, I am calling this meeting to order at 9.03 a.m. on Friday, July 22nd, 2022. Um, it's good to see everybody. Um, this is kind of a jam-packed agenda, and actually it is um, our first um, meeting uh, for fiscal year 23. Um, and as everybody knows, we have some very, very um, fabulous subcommittees, so a lot of these things have been addressed. Um, but we're bringing them forward again. Um, and also, um, you know, we're gonna take a look at where we've been and where we're going, <clears throat> all that good stuff. So um, the first item, and I think, um, Brian, you wanna handle that is, uh, we're gonna move to change the agenda around just a little bit. Do uh, you wanna take public comments? And then I'll do, I'll change, I'll propose. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, let's do public comments first. So do we hear, have any public comments? Okay, hearing none. Um, Brian, you want to? Uh, well, thank thank you for that. Yeah, I wanted to to propose a, a change to the amendment. Two parts. Uh, one was to move uh, agenda item eight A up. That is the comprehensive plan underneath the environmental infrastructure piece, uh, and move it up before agenda item five. Uh, that's just to lift the comprehensive plan and build it up front uh, of the agenda. Uh, and then to add agenda item 5B, uh, which has to do with our Shrek bonds um, that would follow our update on incentive programs. So we would add that second agenda item. Uh, so the, that would be the proposed amendment to the agenda, and we would need a motion to approve those changes. Do I hear a motion to approve those changes? It's actually just to it's make a lot more sense because this we're front loading <laughs> this meeting with uh, some heavy duty stuff and this makes a lot more sense to deal with this up front. Do I hear a motion? I'll, 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 motion. I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion, Lonnie. Floor. I'll thank second, you a second. Adrian. Hey, thank you, Adrian. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, moving on. Um, so the first item actually is our consent agenda. Um, did you wanna dive into that, Brian? Yeah, let me, uh, just quickly uh, in terms of these items. Uh, so we've got the meeting minutes from the June 24th meeting. Uh, this is that time of year after we've completed fiscal year 22. So our fiscal year ended in June. Uh, the team has put together their progress to targets reports for financing programs, incentive programs, and investments. Um, and those are important at this time to get done is so we can do our staff performance reviews that happens over the late summer, early fall. Uh, then we come back to the board with a final uh, red line edit to those uh, memos. And just so you know, like in the past, my observations have been, you know, very limited red line uh, edits. Our team is really good at capturing data up front. Um, so uh, if there have been any changes in the past, it's been immaterial to the overall progress on the target. Uh, and then governance compliance reporting, uh, you all are aware that we do issue our annual comprehensive financial report in October. Uh, this is just the annual fiscal year 22 report out on, uh, you know, a board attendance, committee attendance, um, ethics compliance, um, resolutions, uh, just a summary of year end. Uh, and then we've got, per our last meeting in June, the uh, consent agenda process for approving the reservation of funds letters for the energy storage solutions uh, program. So. Uh, so those are the four items on the consent agenda, and then we included several other things, just as FYIs, uh, PSAs over $75,000. We do that report out uh, as part of our uh, operating procedures at the end of every fiscal year, so that's just a notation. Uh, we also do a report on transactions that were restructured. Uh, we had no restructured transactions, but we're just simply reporting out. Uh, and then from time to time, we do file comments with the DOE, and we filed some comments recently to the loan program office. So I just wanted to share those. 
So those are the four items on the consent agenda. Okay, and we're not dealing with um, the Kevin Walsh recommendation on this? Uh, no, that will be the next agenda item, I recommend. Okay, good. I was trying to, it was a floating, <laughs> it appeared to be a floating item. <laughs> Um, okay, do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. It's Tom. Okay, thanks, Tom. Do you hear a second? Bettina, second. Thank you, Bettina. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Good, moving on. All right, um, so our next um, item, Bill 4A, I see, okay. Um, so this is something we actually are very excited to be able to find a way. When board members have made incredible contributions and they're gonna move on, we still wanna be able to figure out a way to interact with them, uh, if, if they're so uh, moved, um, uh, to, to, to utilize that talent if necessary. and. Um, and so we really needed to figure out a way to make it sure that it was all copacetic. And uh, I think Brian Farn is going to talk about that. Brian? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Lonnie. So back in October of 2021, the board established this ad hoc advisory committee. And the whole purpose is to solicit expert advice to advance the mission of the Green Bank. Um, the first person that came to mind was Kevin Walsh. You know, he is a leader in the clean energy, clean energy uh, industry. Um, we were so lucky to have him on our board. He's just a wealth of knowledge and connections and network and networking. So um, we brought this to the ACG. Um, one of the, idea, the ideas that kind of came up was, okay, um, you know, as we're going to build this out, how do we want to do that? Um, one th uh, a couple suggestions came up. Um, that's why this is not just for the approval of Kevin uh, uh, Walsh. Um, the idea is like, okay, well, how do you deal, you know, when we bring on other members or say we bring on someone who's, you know, in the fuel cell industry and, you know, there's a vote on something that deals with the fuel cells. So one, one thing you need to remember is that these uh, uh, ad hoc committee members will never be voting. They're basically advisory in nature. So they can bring their specialized knowledge to us, but then everything would always still need to be voted on at the committee or board level. Uh, in an abundance of caution, what we did is um, I drafted up a uh, uh, ad hoc advisory committee ethical conduct policy. It's really based off our board um, ethics uh, policy. And so, so it's gonna be two things. It's gonna be a, the uh, approval of Kevin plus the adoption of this policy. So with that, um, I'll entertain any questions. Brian, where did we where did we stand on the requirement to complete the SFI? Uh, Great question. Actually, I should have brought that up because so, I, I did take um, a look at that, and and I just I have questions about it to the scope sure. of what anyone would be doing. So I I talked to the Office of Ethics um, about the SFI requirement, and they were um, clear that the SFI requirement would not apply to these non-voting advisory members. I said, okay, if we wanted to proactively ask um, these members to do this, could the um, ethics committee, uh, I mean, could the um, Office of Ethics uh, submit into them? It's like, well, they're like, we've never been asked this question before, but we could um, have them uh, submit in the SFI. Um, I will say, though, that I went out and informally talked to, um, let's say, past board members, and I believe you will likely not get Kevin and you likely wouldn't get other members to sign on, especially when you have these individuals who probably have somewhat complex finances, to have them in a volunteer position where they're a non-voting member have to do the SFI. So I, I would recommend against uh, having that as a requirement because I think it could be a barrier to getting some of these volunteers. We could still do it. Um, you know, it, it would be a, a best-in-class approach to ensuring that there's no conflicts. Um, but I, what I would suggest instead is that we use the adoption of the the ethics policy as kind of the um, uh, the middle ground that could potentially get at potential concerns about uh, conflicts of interest 
without having these individuals. Because the reality is, you know, if you have them do the SFI, the statement of financial interest, it's not like they're a board member. Like you guys, uh, the board members are participating in board meetings, uh, committee meetings, chairing committees. Um, we're not going to be calling on them on a regular basis. It's not like tomorrow we're going to say, okay, Kevin, we're putting you to work on X, Y, and Z. So we may only call upon them maybe once a year or twice a year, depending on, um, you know, something that comes to the board and we, we want to really engage them. So for the amount of potential work they're doing, it would, there would be a big ask of them. That, that, that makes sense. I just, my, my question about the scope now of what they do, I just want to make sure that we're, we're, turning square corners with uh, with OSC here is that they're not, you know, the these emeritus board members are not going to be, you know, recommending private companies for contract and they're not going to be rec recommending standards for any contracts. That's the, the piece that I was looking at in the at OSC where where I thought maybe these positions might fall into. So if, if we're OK with not involving them in those types of things, I, I think we probably you know, we would be OK. Yeah, I, I, I think we could kind of have that that line so they're not making those types of recommendations. I think we'd be having them look at kind of general kind of uh, items that are going on within the industry and things like that. So we wouldn't have that issue. Okay, if that's if that's how we're gonna handle, I think that it will work. Okay, thank you. Oh, Brian, Any other <laughs> questions or observations? Uh, yes, thanks, Lonnie. So um, we just, I just haven't, my council has not reviewed this yet. So I'm going to have to abstain from voting. We would want to take a look, you know, have council take a look at it. Well, if you do, we could move this to the next meeting if, because I wouldn't want to adopt something and then have Deep's council have concerns. I mean, if, if, if you would like your council to review it, maybe we should move this item to the next, um, in the abundance of caution, move it to the next that meeting. That makes sense. I mean, that's kind of a key player. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that would be great. I would like to have them, you know, I think it, it, it requires a little bit of a deep dive to catch up to where you are, Brian, and maybe they can meet with you. Okay. That would be all right. So do we table? need a motion to? I think we would just table it, table the item to the next meeting. Okay. That works. I think you need All a right, motion to table though. Lonnie, you I could think you also need a to table or modify or the could you also motion. just could you move it to a date certain which would be our next meeting? Why don't you just table it? That way it gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah, I think it's a better idea because we don't know what's going on with deep in terms of um, you know, it's summer. <laughs> Who's, a, who's on de on deck and who's traveling and, and all of that, so. I and Laura, so you, would, you would do it by a motion to table the item. Okay. So, Have do we you motion to table the item? <laughs> I make that motion. I'll second, and thank you. Absolutely. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 We heard all our eyes. I don't know if you heard my eye for uh, uh, voting for it. I did. Good, good. Um, opposed? Abstaining? All right. The item to table. Okay, now this is um, the amended agenda, first amended agenda item. Um, the, and this is really dealing with the, the comprehensive plan that we, um, the Green Bank is mandated to do. Um, and we now have um, uh, been, in, environmental in, infrastructure has been added to uh, our to-do list. And so we, we've done some, uh, some serious talk about deep diving into these issues and, uh, um, take a look at and so we're going to do this comprehensive plan presentation and Sarah Harari is one of the team members who really has been driving you know organizing this um, she's uh, as we know the associate director for innovation and strategic and strategic advisor 
to the president and CEO of the Green Bank. So Sarah, you want to take over? Sure. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so uh, I know that we reported out on the strategic retreat at the last meeting, um, but you know, and thank you to so many of you who were able to join us uh, for it. Um, we wanted to take some of the learnings and the themes that came out of that and condense it into a very digestible, shareable tool. Um, and so we've created a short video that we're going to share with you today. Uh, and it's really intended to be a, a, a companion to the comprehensive plan. Uh, it's a representative, a representation of some of the key takeaways uh, of the plan and the themes of the retreat. So I uh, hope that you all enjoy it. And thank you to Cherry for uh, doing the voiceover. <laughs> Here we go. In Kinetic effort to confront climate change and grow, the Green Bank decided to protect the cultivating humans to help change the future we all see. Zero carbon world, where the world is cleaner, people healthier, the opportunity is more abundant, and the economy is more robust. That world, that world, needs our green shelter. The Green Bank's 10 years of remarkable growth are rooted in a commitment to equity, accessibility, positive real world change. The Green Bank meets challenges by Brian, the sound's not working. So um, maybe maybe we also oh, just shoot. it's actually creating a negative. <laughs> I think we gotta rethink this. <laughs> that works. So I mean, I, I think that um, in a lot of ways the, the image pulls out some of the main themes of the, of the video, but we will share this all afterwards with you so that you can see um, some of the, the main themes that, that came out and uh, how we're going to be building from our, our strong foundation into the new environmental infrastructure future. Uh, Chair Reed, is there anything that you want to add to that? Um, no, I mean, I think it's an, one, of, one of the great things that came out of the strategic retreat is how eager key stakeholders are to work with us. And also that uh, the Green Bank has, um, you know, the ability to kind of, because, because we've worked with these people and we are working with so many people, to have a real sense of who the effective stakeholders are and, and where partnerships might be, should be encouraged and that kind of thing. And that really came out that uh, there's a huge eagerness to um, to work together so we can all go forward together and, you know, uh, faster and more affordably. So I think, I think and, and I think the more that we keep, we continue pursuing our, our shared objectives this way, the better off we'll be. Sarah? Yeah, uh, excellent summary. Thank you so much again for, for being part and leading the effort on the, on the, <laughs> the new audio side. All right, so thank you for that. Forgive me for that audio. It sounded like uh, the audio wasn't coming through. My my phone was right up to that mic. Um, but uh, we will send around uh, the audio um, uh, for you all, but definitely a companion piece to the comprehensive plan. Um, yeah, so we've been really busy at work. Uh, we put this plan together last June. Uh, to execute all these different pieces and are now bringing the full comprehensive plan to the board. Um, lots of pieces. I feel like this has been the hardest year I've ever worked, um, you know, to doing this side thing while also trying to advance our clean energy goals and objectives too. Um, so, you know, engaging deep all along the way, the bureau chiefs, um, the various leaders in the different branches of deep, uh, working to the, to look at our various governance documents and make sure those are in alignment with the public act expanding the scope of the Green Bank, uh, looking at our bond potential, and I suspect we'll continue to look at our bond potential because a 50-year bond 
uh, is really a unique uh, policy tool. Uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, Ashley Stewart and I for more than nine months have been engaging students, uh, uh, stakeholders across the board. Uh, we're currently wrapping up water and entering waste and recycling. Uh, and then, of course, our strategic retreat, which we had to uh, reorganize several times because of COVID, uh, but we were finally able to hold it in April. Uh, and then today we're bringing forward uh, the comprehensive plan. Uh, so I was mentioning that this is our stakeholder engagement cycle. We're coming out of water. We have maybe maybe two more stakeholders, that, water utilities that we're talking to. Uh, and then uh, we're going to be jumping right into waste and recycling, uh, including our tour next week at the Quantum Biopower Food Waste to Energy Plant in Southington. Um, so we'll be working on waste and recycling for a quarter. And then um, environmental markets, as you'll see, are all kind of cross-cutting issues with carbon offsets and ecosystem services. Uh, but we've tried to put all, pull all that together into our comprehensive plan, which builds on you know, our existing clean energy work uh, and adds the environmental infrastructure uh, segments. Um, so the comprehensive plan broadly you know, includes a really in-depth look at the organization, uh, it dives into the programs, our incentive, financing, and environmental infrastructure programs. Uh, it has a section on bonds and how we are developing our bond capacity to be able to raise proceeds to support programs. Uh, it has sections on our sources of different types of revenues to support our activities on investments from, from you know, our system benefit charge and REGI, our public revenues to uh, federally received competitive uh, RFP revenues. Uh, impact, we've got a really good impact section there that speaks to how we measure our social and environmental impact as a result of enabling more investment in the green economy, leading to clean energy deployment and environmental infrastructure deployment. Uh, reporting, really good section there, tying uh, the reader to all of our different reports from our annual comprehensive financial report to the more marketing uh, abridged version that we provide uh, to the legislature and others, to uh, the auditors of public account, you name it, they're all embedded in there. Uh, our research and development section, uh, and then the budget. Um, so uh, the table of contents really a useful guide as you kind of work yourself through the comp plan. Um, obviously it focuses on our two areas of focus, clean energy and builds in environmental infrastructure. Uh, what we will be doing is uh, taking the primers. We included uh, several of the primers in the board materials and using those as attachments to the comp plan to help readers see the opportunities in the agriculture, land conservation, parks and recreation, you know, environmental market space. And as we work through water and waste and recycling, we'll come out with similar uh, primers to support that. Each of those primers, you know, as Ashley Stewart and I work through them, is literally like, in my view, like a master's thesis piece of work. Um, if you haven't taken a look at it, take a look at it. There's really good in-depth insights from a green bank lens perspective on these different areas of environmental infrastructure. Um, and then, you know, the audience, you know, this depth, this gives us the board and the staff our direction. That this is what we operate by. Uh, it communicates to stakeholders. You know, there are a lot of people in Connecticut who want to know what we're doing. Uh, there are also a lot of people nationally who, uh, you know, Connecticut has become a model for. So this document serves to help guide them in their efforts to enable more private investment. Uh, and then in the end, it meets our statutory requirement for uh, delivering a comprehensive plan. Um, so we talked about this last month in terms of uh, what was happening at the strategic retreat, but uh, uh, one of the uh, outputs of that retreat was to come up with a revised uh, mission statement. And, uh, you know, our old mission statement um, was made uh, clearer uh, given the feedback of uh, members attending that strategic retreat. It's still very similar, uh, you know, confront climate change front and center. You know, that was strongly expressed uh, at the offsite strategic retreat. Uh, maintaining the investment element of what we do by mobilizing investment into the economy, uh, but speaking more to you know some of the outputs that we're after or the outcomes that we're after, a more resilient Connecticut, a healthier Connecticut, an equitable community. So those things really popped. Um, 
one of the things we tasked uh, Sarah, Rudy Sterk, and uh, Emily Basham with was taking all the feedback, which is what you see in the right-hand image there, uh, based on the discussions of those at the strategic retreat, and trying to come up with a revised mission statement. And I, I think they did a great job. Happy to dig into this uh, further if members of the board want to. Um, in terms of environmental infrastructure, this is really our playbook for the year. And where I felt like fiscal year 22 was all about, you know, something, a newborn, uh, you know, fiscal year 23 is really about getting to the crawling and maybe the standing up stage. We're not even walking yet, you know, definitely not running. Um, so we're going to continue uh, to build the team. And why I say continue is because we hired Ashley Stewart uh, to be our manager of community engagement. I'm really excited by that. So she's been uh, with me for the last nine plus months in, down in the trenches uh, with various stakeholders. So she has joined, she has joined us. Um, one of the things we will be doing uh, as a result of today's uh, board resolution is approving the position description for the Director of Environmental Infrastructure. This was something that I was to have delivered to you all in October of last year, but there was just no way to be, uh, to be able to clarify what that role would have been at that time. We needed the time to go through what we did in order to lay out that description. And I think uh, we're, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. We're going back to the days of finding a Burt Hunter. We need to find uh, someone to lead uh, this program here uh, in Connecticut. Uh, we're going to continue our engagement. We've got to wrap up uh, the two areas that I mentioned, water, waste, and recycling. Uh, and we're going to be initiating engagement with municipal and regional governments uh, with the focus on vulnerable communities. I was already uh, one of the keynote speakers at the Council of uh, small towns uh, annual event last month. So we're just going to start to uh, put our plan together for municipal outreach to discover more about what they need in terms of environmental infrastructure. Uh, raising resources, you know, obviously right now at the federal government, uh, competitive resources are going to start to open up. Uh, foundation funding, uh, there are some opportunities on the table there. Uh, and then continuing to develop our green liberty bonds uh, to support uh, investments in various areas that, uh, you know, again, we're, we're really looking to bring in our director of environmental infrastructure, like immediately. So hopefully in the next quarter, we'll be able to do that. And then we'll be able to start thinking investments. Uh, but we do have several products that we need to, to launch. We've uh, already, the board has approved of the Smarty Loan being expanded to include environmental infrastructure measures. Uh, those measures will be recommended to the Deployment Committee for review and approval. Uh, we're working closely with the DEEP team on resilience uh, as a starter, and um, uh, I suspect, you know, over the next three, six, nine months, we'll have several series of recommendations to expand the Smarty Loan uh, in those different sectors. And then with CPACE expansion passing last session to include resilience and EV recharging infrastructure, uh, our teams will be building resilience into that product. So you'll be seeing that come sometime this fiscal year. Uh, and then lastly, where there are research opportunities to help us identify, you know, a lot of this is really about trying to bring other revenues into these environmental infrastructure projects, whether those are carbon offsets or ecosystem services, trying to find ways of bringing the green delta into markets, uh, either voluntarily or through compliance markets, so that we can generate more cash flow to support these types of projects. Uh, I, we'll be looking at supporting research in those areas. Um, so that uh, is an overview of the comp plan, and forgive me with the technical difficulty there. Yeah, when, when you do receive it, please all look at it. It's very short, and it kind of just encapsulates all, all of what Brian just said, <laughs> and it really shows the focus that uh, that we have. So, um, are there any questions or observations? Do I hear a motion to approve Resolution Ten? So moved, Adrian speaking. Thank you, Adrian. Um, do we hear a second? It's Laura. It's Laura. It's all second. Thank you, Laura. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Opposed? Abstaining? This is Vicki. I'm going to abstain just because I haven't um, gotten, just I just haven't heard back from my friends over on the other side of the agency on this one. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. So our next item of business, um, oh, incentive programs and updates and recommendations. I think Sergio, is that you? Yes. Good morning, Sergio. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Sergio Carrillo. I'm director of incentive programs. I'm going to show the fiscal year 22 results uh, for the incentive programs, as you can see in this table, uh, RCP and RCP um, achieved 92% of the goals. Um, in terms of projects, we had uh, 1,592 versus 1,732. That 92% is the same for capital deployed and capacity. Uh, what happened in RCP, an RCP is that at the end of the, the RC program officially ended December 31 when the 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 solar pro, the solar industry moved to a tariff based uh, uh, project uh, that is being managed by the utilities. So in December 31 we had approved 100% of, of, of the goal. However, we lost some of some projects in that transition from RCIP to the to the tariff. And I'm gonna show you a little bit, some, some details about that, about how, how we lost that uh, additional capacity. But anyways, but overall, we remarkable uh, achievements for RCIP and RCP. Um, Smarty uh, did extremely well, uh, exceeding all the targets in projects by 114%. Uh, capital deployed 132% of the target and the capacity uh, is the only one that fell short. We achieved 31% of the goals. Given that uh, the major contributors to their projects were um, home performance and HVAC that do not have a megawatt capacity associated with those projects. Uh, home performance, uh, contributed 10% of the of the 909 projects, um, and that includes windows and insulation. And uh, HVAC was primarily heat pumps, uh, ground source heat pumps, air source, and geothermal. They completed 791 projects, almost 90% of their goal. So overall, Smarty did extremely well throughout the year. Um, solar for all or the Posigen also did extremely well, blowing the, the targets out of the water with 344% of the number of projects and yeah, 300% uh, percent plus in capital deployed and capacity deployed. Uh, battery storage, uh, we've had a slow start for the program we we were really expecting to be able to deploy some um some assets by uh during the fiscal year but that wasn't the case i'm going to explain a little bit more in in in, in a couple of slides what happened on battery storage but yes we couldn't get the program uh off the ground uh, overall we achieved 100% of the number of projects, 98% of capital deployed, and 86% of capacity deployed. Uh, all in all, it's a very successful year. Again, this is the official end of RCP and RCP. Is there any questions on that? All right, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is uh, how we ended the fiscal year in RCIP. The RCIP, we were able to complete 349.982 megawatts out of 350. That is 99.99% completion, which is just remarkable. A very, very successful uh, 
project no uh, yeah project uh on rcp we uh we're almost done completing all the projects so what you see in orange is approved projects that carried over or were grandfather uh, from rc into this year and that we're currently working on on switching those orange areas to green to completing those projects uh the the areas in gray are those projects that we had approved but they were not able to provide the documentation by December 31 to be grandfathered under RC. So we had to drop those projects. And that's the 92% that you saw in the previous slide. But overall, great, great uh, performance. Again, remarkable what we were able, what the team was able to, to achieve on the RC side. Is there any questions related to RC? Sergio, this is Brian. Just a just a comment. Uh, uh, Chair Reed and Mayor Hoydick will appreciate this. Going back to Public Act 1180, when I think it was Section 105 had the the RCIP program of a 30 megawatt target by the end of 2022, uh, that was increased to 300 megawatts in 2015, and then to 350 megawatts in 2019. Um, so our last report. Uh, which we, we file biannually reports with ENT will happen this January on the RCIP. And to Sergio's point, the RCIP program, uh, per the policy, ends at the end of 2022. So we will be providing the ENT committee with a report out on the RCIP program. So, yes, we're also communicating to the contractors that this is the end december 31 is the drop dead uh day to complete projects whatever is not completed by december 31 will be just cancelled and those projects will lose their incentives we're in the process to, to communicating to contractors yeah uh, on battery storage uh again just uh, uh, the the start of the program has been a little little slow and has been slow because we've been building the the infrastructure needed to to manage the program including uh the application portal the the, the workflow management system that we built from scratch uh the contractors vetting um the the review of the new technologies we started with uh, the project without any technology approved to participate in the program and we have been working on on, on, on reviewing uh, vetting approving those technologies um on uh, also building educational resources for contractors and uh, and homeowners or all stakeholders to you know learn about the program learn how to join the program the benefits of owning a battery etc so there's been a lot of uh work being done um however the 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 last piece of the of the of the process which is the integration with the derms platform the derms platform is the is the platform that actually used by the utilities to actually send the signals to the batteries to actually operate to discharge um that is uh you know we've had some issues with there we're, we're still working out all the all the details the tmcs the uh the communication um uh, protocols between the batteries and this platform etc there's a lot of work still to be done there however there is a strong interest in the program we have received uh roughly one megawatt of applications of residential projects we have approved um, 185 kWs. That was as of as of June 30. Right now, I think we have uh, uh, greater approvals on the residential side. And on the non-residential, as you are aware of, we we um, achieved those 50 megawatts of application. You know, within 60 days of opening the program. Um, but we have only been able to approve 2.9 megawatts. After today's meeting with the approval of those incentives uh, that account for 33 megawatts of capacity, then you will see the the non-resident uh, the non-residential uh, capacity 
uh, being close to being depleted. Uh, we will be at 36 megawatts out of, out of uh, 50. Maybe in a month or so, we will come back with the remaining projects. We're just working with the contractors to to gather the documentation necessary to uh, to bring bring those projects to the board. But that's the status of um, battery storage. Is there any any questions? This is Lonnie. Uh, Sergio, I just want to point out too that this is yet another area <laughs> that has been handed to the Green Bank to do. So Pura has asked that um, we step in and help make the, the battery storage uh, situation work. And obviously there is, I mean, that's where we're going. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. Sergio and, and the whole team has been really <laughs> working 24 seven uh, dealing with this and several other things. So wanted to point that out. Thank you. Yes. Um, Sergio, um, this is Adrian speaking. I just wanted to find out how many projects this represents. Um, obviously, the residential is going to have a higher number of, of projects, but you know, when you got to manage projects, um, it, it almost is uh, more attractive to have the commercial ones because you know you have a, a big uh, um, kilowatt um, level on each project compared to the residential, but um, so how many projects does that 185 kilowatts um, represent and how many are underway for the non-residential? Yes, on the residential side, we have received 125 applications, 125. Of, which, of which we have approved 39 of those 125 applications. So okay. the uh, the 185 kWs is is roughly is around 30 projects, okay. residential projects. Mm -hmm. uh, on the non-resi side, it's a whole different story, much much larger systems. We have received 45 applications, um, and those are systems that average 1.7 megawatts uh, in size. It's like it's like hundreds, each project is, is the equivalent of yeah. hundreds of residential projects. Uh, but yes, we have 45 projects on the non-RESI side and 125 in, on RESI. Thank you. Any other question? All right, next slide, please. Um, and now we're going to we're going to talk about the asset-backed securities bonds. So, Bert, do you want me to to provide this background, and then you, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, that would be good. You you tee it up, and then I'll I'll put it in the context of our bonds. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. So, um, so as, as you as you might remember, right, we came here. Uh, more than a year ago, explaining about the 3G network shutdown. The three 3G network companies in the in the country were going to shut down their 3G networks. And that was going to affect all the systems uh, participating in the, or a very large percent of the systems participating in RSIP. Their ability of these, of the meters, of the PV system meters, to send production data to our monitoring platform that is called uh, Locus. When we um, noticed this, we identified 5,000 residential projects that were going to have to be replaced. And we, we did an, R, uh, an RFP. We hired three contractors to start the replacements of those 3G meters, around 5,000 meters. Um, by year end, by the end of the fiscal year, we had replaced only 50% of those meters. And the reasons for that are several, but are basically supply chain related. There's shortages of meters, shortages of uh, nationwide, shortages of uh, meter sockets, which is the metal boxes where the meters are housed uh, in your homes. Um, and uh, COVID, right? COVID affecting 
all the contractors as well. So there were many, many delays. There were weeks where we would not install a single meter because we didn't have anything in uh, stock. Um, so anyways, by the end of the fiscal year, we have achieved 50% replacement of the revenue grade meters that we had identified. We understood that TPOs were being affected the same. We expected TPOs to replace their meters uh, because they're obligated, contractually obligated to replace their meters or to keep meters working and communicating with our locus platform. Um, but we knew they were going to be affected as well. Because of that, uh, we went to the uh, NIPL GIS and uh, requested approval of to use a methodology developed by Professor Kane Gillingham to estimate the production of those meters that were going to be operating, but we were not going to be able to capture the, their production. Without their production, we cannot create RECs or SHREKs. Uh, so there was going to be a, a, a financial impact there. We received approval initially for those 5,000 meters that we had identified. Once, once we realized, hey, TPOs are going to uh, also be affected by this, we went back to NIPL GIS we, uh, uh, and they approved that we could use the, uh, the methodology to actually estimate production for any meters participating in our state that was going to be affected by 3G. We estimated probably around between 10 and 15,000 meters were going to be affected. And uh, it happened at the end of February with the shutdown of the AT&T network, we uh, lost probably 10,000 meters, roughly 10,000 meters lost, meaning we, we stopped seeing them in the locus uh, platform. So um, again, we have the King Gillingham uh, methodology to to uh, estimate the production of those meters. And uh, just recently, a um, couple of weeks ago, we used first quarter of 2022 production data to create RECs. It's, it happens a quarter after a quarter after the production has been settled. So in July 10, we created RECs and shreks, file those shreks and shreks with the NEPO GIS. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we had lost many, many meters due to the 3G uh, shutdown. Uh, we used the Ken Gillingham methodology. He was able to uh, estimate probably 5% of our entire production. Um, and uh, he was able to recover for us probably one third of the rec, uh, revenues that otherwise would have been foregone revenues. Um, the, the, the recreation is a window. It opens in July for the first quarter. Uh, you either file shreks or you, if you miss the window, that production is, is, is lost. Those shreks, you're not able to create recs with that production later on. So, uh, that's the status. Um, we 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 lost some production, um, and uh, and that's what Bert is going to uh, explain now. So yes, to uh, to bring that uh, in the context of our uh, of our bonds that are outstanding, uh, the issue relates to the first Shrek bonds that we issued in. Uh, in March of 2019. Uh, these are the uh, so-called asset-backed securities bonds. Now, these are the bonds that were designed to uh, stand on their own without um, any uh, support from the Green Bank as contrasted to uh, the more recent Green Liberty bonds, which were issued with the support of the uh, Shrek, uh, sorry, with the support of the uh, special Capital Reserve Fund, which has uh, as a required element a project support agreement where the Green Bank can top up any uh, temporary or periodic shortfalls uh, that might arise in that structure, which there have been uh, none to date. So 
um, as it relates to the Shrek ABS bonds, as they stand on their own, there are uh, particular requirements for uh, to to have periodic periodic covenant tests to make sure that there is sufficient revenue or to provide an earl, early warning of a revenue shortfall uh, for the bondholders. Uh, these covenants were uh, were tripped starting with uh, the March a payment uh, that was uh, was made on March 15 in re respect to these bonds. And that shortfall related to uh, two hurricane events that we had in August and September of, uh, of last year where production was impaired. Um, 2021 was a, has been, was a bad solar year generally. Uh, these these um, uh, solar uh, Insulation um, and meteorological performance uh, of sunlight uh, comes in cycles. Uh, 21 was a down cycle, in, in addition to, and we're still in a bit of a of a down cycle right now. Um, we think we're coming out of it. However, um, compounding that were were the two hurricanes. So uh, we ended up uh, tripping, just uh, just tripping, uh, tripping that uh, by $175,000 worth of production, which translates into about 5% of production, uh, meaning if production had been about 5% higher, uh, then uh, we would have been in the clear. But uh, but we did trip that. Now that um, that gets. Um, compounded by the fact that we have this shortfall in reporting, as was just explained by uh, Sergio, and um, so we will uh, we are still in a um, uh, re reporting trip uh, for the second period, which is um, which was reported out in June. Um, although there were sufficient funds to make make payments on the bonds. Um, so we're not in a shortfall cash wise, but we are still, um, we're still breaking that covenant. So uh, the, the issue that this creates for the bondholders is, and for us, um, first of all, for us, this becomes kind of a reputational issue for the Green Bank if the bond rating agency, which is Kroll, which has our bonds on watch developing, um, uh, downgrades the bonds, uh, and uh, those those bonds have been uh, A rated. The senior bonds have been A rated. The, the junior bonds have been triple B rated, uh, so they could be uh, downgraded. Um, and uh, the other issue is that since the bondholder is an insurance company, it could become a capital reserve issue for the bondholder if those. Um, if the bond rating is insufficient, generally your capital that, that an insurance company has to put against its investments in bonds and uh, is is related to the rating on the bonds that it holds in portfolio. So if those ratings weaken, then uh, they uh, can be required to allocate more capital against those bonds, which is not a good thing from an insurance company point of view. So, um, so our proposal is that we work with the bondholder to amend the bond documents to permit uh, the Green Bank the option, not the requirement, but the option to cure revenue shortfalls for matters uh, related to interruptions of reporting or production that the Green Bank considers temporary. Uh, that would have the, um, the effect as we have with the Green Liberty bonds of allowing us to um, uh, keep us out of a covenant trip uh, so that we would preserve uh, the rating on the bonds. Uh, in terms of materiality of an economic impact to the Green Bank, none is really foreseen uh, that would be material in any way because generally, the money put in by the Green Bank at the top is just to satisfy that covenant. Uh, as I mentioned, there have been sufficient revenues uh, over you know, an annual period basis to be able to make all the debt service payments so that 
the excess revenues uh, derive to the benefit of the green bank in the end. So we would pick up uh, the monies that we put in at the top, basically at the bottom of the cash waterfall. So um, it's with that that we come to the board for, uh, for the resolutions that are on the next slide. And the next two slides, actually, it's a quite, quite, quite a long resolution. Uh, but it's uh, but we had these drawn up by outside council, uh, same council that we used um, uh, to um, uh, to do these bonds in the first place. So happy to address any questions. And Brian Farnan is also on the line, uh, so he can address anything from a legal perspective. Um, this is Bettina from uh, the office of the state treasurer. A uh, couple of questions, Bert. Um, how many bondholders are there? One. And who's that? Um, we haven't disclosed that publicly in the past. Okay. It's an insurance company. Okay. And what was the, the coverage test? What was the, the coverage ratio that, that you tripped? There are, there, are, there are two. One's called an early amortization event. And it requires a, a re, require, and that's where it looks at two quarters of performance, and that required uh, ratio is 1.1 1 .1 to one. Uh, okay. And then we have what's called a, a sequential interest amortization event, which requires a ratio of 1.0 to one. In the most um, recent, in the most recent period, we actually satisfied the uh the sequential interest amortization event which just looks at one quarter but we uh failed on the early amortization uh event which is a two-quarter test okay and who's the law firm that drafted the resolution brian sure uh, uh pullman and Conley. Right. So we, we use pretty much Shipman and Goodwin for the majority of our work uh, because of their uh, Lee Hoffman, who is a pure regulatory specialist. We decided to use the combination of their bond uh, expertise with Nancy Hancock, who's amazing, um, with also having Lee Hoffman, who could provide uh, the Pura background. That's the, re that's the main reason why this is the only bond issuance that we did that's not with Shipman. The rest are with Shipman, but this one was with uh, with Pullman. And have you already reached out to the bondholder? Um, we have the our investment bankers, uh, RBC Capital Markets. That's been uh, scheduled for next Friday. Great. Okay, so this this will yeah. get you through. And oh, I have another question. Uh, the Kroll rating, the, the triple B, is that a flat triple B or is that a triple b minus so that if you that would slip into junk category uh good question i'll have to circle back to you on that okay all right that's all i have might be able to pull that this, up early. yeah this is tom i've got a couple questions if i might for <clears throat> um first of all it says note a and note b um the note a holders are getting paid the new b holders are not getting paid is that how um, to understand this that's correct they're both are they two separate note holders and and the note b is the uh insurance company is that correct or am i the I wrong? the insurance company owns both the a's and the b's got it so we're paying so they've been paid on some of it and not on all of it uh, they've been paid on the A's are are currently getting all of the uh, yeah. all their principal and they're getting extra principal because it goes basically goes turbo. So meaning yeah. that That's all, all available cash flow goes to uh, to the A's while while so this, in that this sense, is happening. Sorry, uh, the, which goes to my next question. So because we've tripped the covenant, the the penalty, the economics of tripping that covenant is that everything goes to the A and the B uh, does not get paid out until the covenant is cured. Is that correct? Correct. So 
uh, when do we anticipate both covenants being cured or the covenant that you broke? I, I might have just missed that you said that. This could this could continue for uh, for a few quarters until we get past this uh, this reporting issue, which is the reason we are coming uh, to the board to get this accommodation so we can modify the bond documents. So um, yeah, which comes to my next issue. Do we have so you and and forgive my my ignorance on this. But I thought you said there were three reasons um, that why we tripped it. I and again, I might have misheard. Right, the first reason I thought you you referenced the two hurricanes. The second reason is you referenced um, kind of the solar and the sun and and having issues at certain periods of time, and that and I, and I might not have that right. And then That's the correct. third is that this reporting issue. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so the reporting issue is the one that's not within our control because of the cellular networks. Is that what you're saying? Or how is the reporting issue not within our control? It is, uh, well, it's, 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 it's out of our control to the, to the extent that we still have supply chain issues so that there's, uh, so we haven't made the, the, uh, the parties, the vendors that we hired under pursuant to the RFP that the board approved last year, they haven't been making as much progress as as they would have made had there not been the supply chain issues. Uh, and um, what's the, the what's the ETA, Bert? Do we know to get these? You know, to have the suppliers and the team giving you. A, a date, quote unquote, certain that they'll fix these operational issues through the reporting. Uh, Sergio, I don't think we have a date certain, but I think um, we have an estimate. Do you have? Can you add some color there? No, we do not have a, um, any firm uh, uh, estimate from from TPOs. Uh, I expect the revenue grain meters, our project, the project that we control, to to last probably another year. Um, yeah. See, I don't know. I, see, the thing is, what there's a couple things. What's the economic? I know I know the Node A holders are getting paid. It sounds like it gets turbocharged, meaning that they're getting paid off much more quickly. But how much are we losing? How much is this costing us that that we've fall, fallen off the covenant here? What's the economic cost to this? And I would imagine to go into these negotiations, uh, it, there's going to be a cost to that. So I'd like to understand the difference between, you know, the cost of negotiating this out versus the cost of paying it out. And then the third thing is certainly hurricanes aren't within our control. Certainly, the sun isn't within our control, but assuming we don't have two hurricanes, assuming we don't have the continued sun issues, which I don't know you haven't addressed, um, I'd be working very hard to get the operational issue fixed as quickly as possible. Because I've never seen, and maybe I'm wrong here, but these amendments are going to cost money, right? Um, in this particular in this particular case, um, we uh, as in the conversation that I had with uh, with our investment bank, uh, they didn't believe that this would be a material cost. Yeah, that doesn't tell me how much. I, I don't know what the material cost is versus the cost we're losing. I I don't have the economics to show the, you know this amount. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I I would just I would just say from uh, from a from a legal cost uh, perspective, um, and Brian Farner would be the expert here, but I wouldn't I, I would be hard pressed to see this costing more than say twenty five thousand uh, dollars, something in right. that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it would not be more than that. And um, and we're we're not being we're not being charged by our investment bank. So what about the insurance company? Are they going to charge us? Are they? Is there going to be a fee for that? Um, 
that's to be determined, but I would just suggest that since it's in their interest to fix the covenant trip uh, because of the potential downgrade of the bonds, I think they'd be motivated to cooperate. Mm -hmm. The downgrade of the bonds will cost how much? Or is it on their side the cost is the fact that I, they've got to put aside I, the cash? I can't. I can't answer that question. It re it would it would uh, relate to what their capital requirements are uh, on uh, and the rating of the bonds. Mm -hmm. But you don't want that reputational risk of of having bonds downgraded potentially into junk. Yeah, no, I understand that. I'm just trying to understand the economics of this decision, and I'm trying to understand what we're doing on the operational side to fix the only thing that we have somewhat control over which is the reporting the right reporting. i understand the, hur the hurricane thing and i understand the sun thing but the reporting is us and we need to get that resolved we can't just paper it over with us and, so, and i don't know if that gets that, it there tom if i may say in in that regard yeah as far as the the reporting so the issue yeah. is on uh, the issue has been as far as the systems not reporting, we do have this method uh, that was approved by the NEFL GIS Markets Committee uh, in January. The issue there is that we've had a ramping factor with trying to get all of the non reporting systems estimated. So we have a process in place where we're, where we're addressing that. So we're trying to close that gap down for the next quarter's reporting cycle, uh, which which Good. ended which ended in June. So we've got that path going, and then we have the the actual changing out of the meters path, which we are on. You know, which so so between the two, we feel confident that we're going to be closing that that gap that we that we had for the first quarter. So and. Mm -hmm. and far as and as far as the 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 economics it's almost kind of if I, if I might say you know the the weather's the weather uh so yep. uh, and as you agree we can't change that so it's really you know versus the things that we can control i think that we're really we we we're putting this in the best possible place uh i've looked at these numbers uh i don't see any material cost uh, as far as implementing this change, you know, meaning from a legal perspective and, and, you know, doing this with the insurance company, of course, you know, that's yet to be determined. Uh, but we don't think it's going to be material. And as far as the economic cost of putting the actual cash in at the top of the waterfall, uh, we fully believe that we're going to be getting back 100% of that cash as this, as this thing cycle, as these cycle through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only thing I, the only thing that gives me pause on uh, what you said, Bert, and I appreciate it, and it's a good discussion, is we say we're on top of the operational issue, the reporting issue, and I get all the work that's being done, but the fact that we don't even have an estimate of when it's going to be completed, I, I would feel much more comfortable if we pressed the, whoever's working on to give us an estimate of when it's going to be completed. That's all. We could. Uh, yeah, point well taken. We can and we'll do that. But again, at the same time, we have the estimated estimation methodology in place, which we're going to close the gap on the systems not reporting by estimating that production, and that uh, that methodology has been has been proven on a back testing basis to be like ninety five ninety. 9.5 percent accurate so so let me uh, ask a question if that if that's the case when do we get out of this default with the covenant if if the yeah so what's the timing of getting out of the default with the covenant are we going to be out next quarter once we report or well, is this going to uh, what's that hangover effect well As, assuming we don't have hurricanes and assuming you know what i'm saying like yeah so yeah and so what we don't know is we don't know if we'll have uh, any hurricanes that are going to hit the Northeast. And we don't know uh, exactly what the, the solar uh, uh, irradiance is going to be, you know, across all the panels. You know, but for that, we would be on track, uh, you know, where where we were, you know, uh, two years ago. By when? 
by this quarter. We're we're putting we're putting the closure of the. I mean, Sergio, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I think that we expect that we're going to be able to account for all the missing systems, uh, particularly with respect to tranche one and tranche two this quarter, because we're prioritizing the estimate, the estimation so of the missing systems in tranche that, one and tranche two this quarter. Yes. Yeah, but first, does that? Yeah, but does that mean then that by the time we report out this quarter, we're not going to be in a default position? Or is that what you're saying? Or are we going to still have a covenant breakage when we report out at the end of this, by the, the end of the quarter? Because the quarter's already done. Yeah, well, I think what I said was the unknown there is the amount of sunlight that's going to hit the panels or if we're going to have a hurricane event. Now, so I, I you know, I can't pass any, I can't forecast the <laughs> sunlight. So yeah, if we, if we, uh, if that's as it was, say, two years ago, no issues. Mm -hmm. In my opinion. This is Bettina. I, I thought I heard Sergio say the reporting issue would could go on for another year. Did I hear that? Yeah. Incorrectly. But that's with that's that's with the uh, the physical change out of the meters. Which is why we have this process of of estimating, estimating. loss right. meters, so we can close the gap in terms of production through the estimation process. Bert, if I may add, uh, and we NEPL approved the use of this methodology up to the end of 2026. So no, we do not expect the replacement of all these meters to last until 2026. Hopefully, in in the fiscal year 2023, we're going to achieve you know 100% replacement. But if we have to go further than that or beyond that, uh, the methodology is is approved by the NIPO GIS. You guys sound like a worst scenario. Have you guys done a worst case scenario, assuming there were, are some hurricanes this year and some uh, continued solar issues? Time. If it if 22 yeah, good question. 21. Um, if we have if we have the same situation that happened, if we have this year occur as it had last year, mm -hmm. uh, we we end we actually had enough cash to to uh, take care of debt service. So the covenant was tripped. But it didn't create a debt service payment problem. So this is why we're comfortable with this approach. Now you got to get crawl comfortable, I guess, right? Right. And to your question, the bonds, the senior bonds are A minus, and the B bonds are triple B minus. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. I was hoping it was flat. All right. Yeah, we got to get this fixed. Any more questions or observations? Good luck. <laughs> Thank you know, you. As with so much of this stuff, this is the business we're in. Yeah. And I, and I think it's interesting that the holder is an insurance company, you know, also dealing with uh, these issues. I'm so. sure they'll be very eager to, to get this resolved quickly. Yes, feels like it. Yeah. Feels like, and it feels like that's a good partner to get a resolve with. Yeah. So do I hear a motion to approve resolution 11? Can you just give a, a just another quick rehab? It's such a long resolution, this is Bettina, I'm sorry. Can you just give a quick um, summary of this very long resolution, what we're approving? Brian, do, do, you, uh, do you want to or? Sure. And, and I can do that. And the reality is this resolution is meant to be very broad because we okay. want the flexibility to be able to work through um, with the counterparties, obviously with the bond documentation. We don't want to, um, they can be prescriptive at points. So we just, it's, it's somewhat broad to give us the flexibility to use green bank funding to basically ensure that there isn't a default under um, uh, uh, under any of our bond covenants. 
for lack of a better okay. word. Okay, because it is lengthy and I had a chance to really dive into it, but I understand the having all the tools in the toolbox available to fix it. So thank you. Yeah, and it pretty much, uh, Bettina, if I might might add, uh, this is this pretty much uh, stays in line with the original uh, uh, bond resolution that we had. So it's it's it pretty much just carries from that. Okay. So do I hear a motion to approve? Tom? Oh, I'll move. <laughs> it's Vicki. Is that Vicki? Yep. Thank you. Do we hear a second? I'll second. Tom? Yep. Good, good. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Thank you, everybody. I know it's difficult, but as I said, this is the business we're in. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very everything much. Is a learning everything is a learning experience. Thank you for the uh, discussion and guidance. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, I see the next item on our agenda, um, financing programs, updates, and recommendations. And I think that we start off with Mackie Dykes. Yes, thank you, Terry. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we'll, we'll start here uh, talking through our performance for FY22. Um, I, at a high level, uh, I, I think a pretty, Good year, aside from a significant issue within one of our programs that uh, you know was was very long was fairly large and impacted our our bottom line totals here. So I'll start there uh, and then we'll dive into some of these numbers. and don't worry, I've got some uh, some other charts that to dive into this that are quite as small. Um, so uh, on the project side, we're just over our target one hundred and two percent on the progress to targets there. On the capital deployed, slightly under at 82%, and then on the capacity side, severely under the target at 32%. Uh, the commercial solar PPA and CPACE, I'm gonna set aside uh, for some deeper discussion in later slides. Um, our Small Business Energy Advantage Program, so this is our partnership with Eversource and Amalgamated Bank to supply capital for their on bill, uh, small business, municipal and state financing program. Uh, we, uh, for the first year, hit our targets. Uh, you might recall in the past uh, uh, that COVID uh, had a severe impact on this program, uh, but we're, you know, the, we seem to be uh, churning along now uh, as we hope when we set this partnership up. Uh, so uh, happy to see the, the numbers there. Uh, we're just over the project total and then 128 uh, percent in terms of the capital deployed target on the multifamily side uh, our health and safety uh, loan we had a target of, of one project uh, we were hopeful we've, we've got two projects approved that will eat up all the the funds that we have uh, the, the, you might recall this is this product was capitalized with a grant from deep uh, and we have enough funds to remaining to to do these two projects. They're both in documentation, and we had expected one of them to close this year. Uh, you know, as often happens with multifamily projects and all the the stakeholders involved in those, uh, it's dragged on longer than we hoped. So this is really just a timing issue. We we do anticipate both of those to close uh, in this fiscal year, FY23, and the other multifamily program where we had targets, the multifamily term, which encompasses the Lime Loan and CPACE. You'll see we uh, overperformed the target there. That's been larger, really, primarily due to uh, the Cargill Falls project, uh, where, where we uh, had a large CPACE, another large CPACE loan go into that. Uh, next slide. So let's dive into our, our two large programs. Uh, so CPACE. Um, 
So I, I, I'm pleased to see that we exceeded the capital deployed target here, um, just just over. So that you know we we get the the impacts in terms of the um, you know the environmental and economic benefits that we we want to see. Uh, we were under the project goal, um, and that's primarily due. Uh, to the Green Bank, uh, where we had less projects, but they were larger uh, than than we've had in the past. Our average project size this year was just under 550,000. Our average size last year was 320,000. Uh, so we're we're seeing an increase in the the like in the average project size that we're doing. So that's how we could you know underperform on the project side, but overperform on the uh, the capital deployed. Um, and you, what you see in the table here is a breakdown uh, between the uh, us, you, you recall, we're the administrator for the program, uh, which allows both us and, and private third party lenders to use the CPAYS platform to secure their investments. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, a, a good story and uh, for, for the product as well as for our role in the market. Uh, you see here that, uh, you know, the, the third party lenders, the private lenders were the, the vast majority of the activity in the market, just over 18 million. Um, but they have, just like we've seen CPACE nationally, uh, they're trending towards larger new construction and, and repositioning projects. Um, most of our lenders won't do a project uh, less than a million dollars. So there's a big gap in the market there, which we are really the only lender serving at this point. So we're, you know, we're playing a very valuable market role by focusing on these smaller projects, uh, particularly retrofits. Um, so again, pleased to see uh, the, what, I, what I think is a, a good sea pace here. Next slide. And now our, our commercial solar PPA. So this is, you know, I referenced the, the one program that uh, saw some pretty serious issues this year. Um, we were, uh, as you see in the, the left, left hand part of the, of the table at the bottom, uh, the sort of gray one, we are severely under target for pretty much all, not for all our key, key goals, projects, megawatts and, and capital deployed. Um, and, and this, in this for this program, we were affected by uh, national trends that and disruptions that that hit the solar U, the U.S. solar market in 2022. Um, it was really a a number of 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 issues uh, that sort of all culminated in uh, significant impacts both in Connecticut as well as across the country. You had supply chain issues. Uh, you had trade issues with the Department of Commerce doing an investigation into circumvention of uh, Chinese tariffs, uh, which impacted 80 to 90 percent of, of module supply into the country. And then just general commodity price and, and wage inflation uh, led to higher costs, reduced supply of equipment and, and lengthened equipment times. So, you know, we saw, as you see the, the stat here, uh, according to Wood McKinsey, 17.6 gigawatts of projects were delayed by over a year. Um, and you know, I, this is really what led to the severe underperformance here. We have the pipeline to have met this goal, uh, primarily through our, our solar map program, our solar uh, marketplace assistance program. With our state and municipal uh, customers, we had incentives in place. Uh, we had contractors lined up uh, through uh, RFPs that we run to do the projects. Uh, and as we were moving towards closing PPAs and EPCs, uh, which we'd hope to do in Q4 of 22, you know, all these all these issues really uh, sort of <laughs> hit us all at once and uh, has led to the delays and we, we just weren't able to close those projects. Um, so they still do remain active um, and we're working with uh, our installers now to try to you know, figure out how to navigate these issues. I mean, you can't escape them. The, the prices are higher. Um, so we're trying to best figure out how to incorporate those into the projects, make sure they, they still make sense and minimize the, the impacts on our state and municipal customers in terms of the, you know, the, the PPA rates that you know, we had, you know, we run lengthy processes to, to get to those rates with the, the towns in the state. Um, so it's once you finally make your way through all the decision makers with those stakeholders with a rate, it's 
it's hard to go back and change it. So we're we're trying to minimize the impact on that, um, recognizing how tough it is to uh, to make adjustments with those customers. So you know, I, I, I hate to I hate to be so under target here, um, but you know, I, I, this was a sort of a, a national issue that uh, you know we really saw affecting our our pipeline of projects here. So I'll pause there for um, any questions on finance and programs performance. So this is Tom. I um, have a couple questions related to the the solar. Um, first of all, I think you're probably lucky that the costs have only gone up single digit percentages based on what I've seen with supply chain issues for some of my own clients. Um, I don't feel you being down here is negative necessarily because my question would be with the increased cost to do these projects, are they actually still affordable right now to do? Or should we put a pause on the program until things get straightened out and we can see whether the economics of these programs still work? That's a great question, great point. Um, I, I, so that, that's exactly what we're looking at. So when I when I reference, you know, working with the with our selected contractors, that's the question we're putting to them. If you know, we, we don't want to buy this stuff now, given uh, everything that's happening. Um, but you know, the, one of the primary issues was this uh, Department of Commerce uh, investigation. Uh, uh, to, I guess to try to summarize it, uh, they were looking at circum several Southeast Asian countries being used to sort of essentially launder uh, panels uh, around the the Chinese tariffs. So you know, taking what are essentially Chinese panels and, and running them through these other other countries. Uh, it, you you saw eighty to ninety percent of of supply just stop shipping. Um, the, you might have seen in the news uh, a month or so ago, you know, thanks to increasing pressure, the Biden administration finally stepped in uh, and uh, used emergency powers to suspend the, the, the investigation still going on. But they said, whatever the finding is, we're going to suspend, you know, if it's to impose tariffs, we're going to suspend the, the uh, imposing those for two years. So it gave at least some uh, at least a window of of when there was no worry about the you know these tariffs hitting. So we 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 see supply coming back online. So thanks to that, you know, we we went back to our contractors and said, you know, we, we certainly want to delay these projects because it doesn't make sense to to purchase now. But if we were to wait until next year and sort of push all our timelines back, what could you do in terms of the pricing? So we're getting those numbers back now, and then we're you know we're doing the analysis to see if we can still make the projects work and um, and the, you know, the numbers are are at least the, the initial numbers are, are that they we still will be able to deliver attractive savings to, to our customers yeah i i would just caution go slow here i don't i don't think it makes sense to be upset about you know missing the deliverable when the market is in such flux i think it makes sense to go slow be cautious and reevaluate each move you make before you commit, because who knows what's going to happen here, really? Absolutely, yeah. The the uh, the only driver against you're right, and if if we would absent any other pressure, I think we could just we 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 hit pause and wait to see where the market's going to go. Fortunately, or fortunately, we we have incentives for these. Uh, projects, which there's a timeline around those, and you start losing revenue. So, you know, it really becomes a balancing act as to how much you want to jeopardize. You know, there's a loss of revenue, and then there's eventually just you, you lose those incentives altogether from the state. So, uh, we're sort of way. dancing that line and figuring out, you know, it's a it's a dance of, okay, like, if our EPC contractors are willing to take the the risk of locking in a price now, that we can, you know, that they're going to make the purchase next year, and they're willing to commit to us, and we can make the projects worth that price. Should we sort of essentially push that, you know, commodity risk onto them rather than us holding it? 
have we discussed with the uh, uh, extending the incentives as we see the market sort itself out? Have we gone and had those discussions about here's what we're seeing in the marketplace? We don't want to lose the incentives, but yet we want to make sure the market sorts itself down. We have we we actually just went to Pura um, to request an, an an extension on our our termination dates for those incentives, and we were granted that. Uh, we we asked yeah. for an extraordinary relief there, since one it's fairly common to get extensions on your your Z racks. We asked above yeah. and beyond what's been granted. However, that's just the termination. They still it's a 15 year contract, and we're still eating it like. You know, every month it's already sort of the 15 year contracts already started. So every month it's, you know, we have less of our 15 years. And they have, Pura has not indicated a willingness to adjust those, you know, the, the, you know to provide relief in, in that area. So these are for contracts that we already have and incentives we already have. How are we managing things for the future here? Are we pausing on that until we see how this market shakes out? Because I understand what you're saying about existing stuff. Um, yet we, for for several reasons, including this, and also one we'll talk about later, uh, we slowed down our solar map program uh, with regard to yeah. sort of you know, everything Connecticut happens based on your incentive calendar for the for the 2022 incentives, we yeah we had very minimal participation in that due to this and other issues. Okay, all right, thank you. Great, I will turn it over then to to Catherine Duncan to uh, talk through some updates to our CPACE program guidelines that we're proposing. Catherine, you there? You're muted. I see your see your initials, but you've got the mute sign on. Okay, I'll uh, I I I can. Maybe Catherine must be having technical issues. I'll uh, I'll get this presentation started, and Catherine, if you're able to resolve those, uh, just just jump in. Um, so the uh, the CPA statute was uh, was updated last year. Uh, thank you. This was a, a a proposal put forward by us to make two major changes. Um, one was to expand. CPACE to finance resiliency measures, and the others was to add uh, zero emission vehicles, so essentially EV, electric vehicles, uh, EV refueling infrastructure uh, as an eligible measure. And both of these, uh, these expansions, so the rechargers and resiliency, were exempted from our, our savings to investment ratio requirement. The thinking there was Resiliency, unlike you know an energy measure that reduces your bill, uh, you don't see those uh, type of savings with uh, resiliency and with chargers. It's really the opposite impact. Your uh, your electric bill goes up because you're now uh, using uh, electric your vehicles. Um, so the the proposal you have put forward. Oh, Catherine, I see. Did you resolve your issues? I see you on mute. Yes, I did, Mackie. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I, I, which bullet point did you get up to? I'm sorry. Uh, just what the statute story changes were. Okay, so, uh, so you can get into the current edits. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the current edits um, to the red line that you have, you know, are that we added the um, mention of the uh, zero emission vehicle refueling infrastructure and we just barely we just mentioned resiliency is an eligible improvement um, then additionally you'll see that uh, we added that uh, both are exempted from the sir requirement and we've added details regarding the infrastructure the refueling infrastructure projects but we will address the resiliency later this year or um, early next year so we we didn't go into any detail there then you'll find there's um, a section about the 
third-party capital provider application process. We've simplified that and just brought it in line with current program practice. And then there are additional edits throughout um, just for clarity. Um, and then, um, so today we are just delivering the red line to you. It will go out for um, public comment in August and we'll come back for approval at the um, October 21st um, meeting. Yeah, I just add this is this is really just implementing the the statutory change on the uh, electric vehicle recharger side. Um, you know, there's not a lot of, sort of policy or, or choices that we're we're making here. The resiliency changes are or will be uh, is, we're much larger, and you know, we still are trying to figure out how to uh, the, the best framework for that. So. Uh, we'll be coming back, uh, as, as Catherine said, later for those. This is really, again, just fairly simply uh, implementing the statute around electric vehicle chargers. There's, really, there's no resolution here. Um, this is really per our, our process as we, uh, as we, the board gave us guidance last time we amended the CPACE guidelines to, um, you know, First, give the board the opportunity to to shape the the the, the changes uh, and showed a preference not to vote uh, on uh, on on the changes prior to public public comment. You know, because you didn't want to be seen as uh, you know not <laughs> uh, give the impression we weren't taking public comment seriously. So, therefore, there's no resolution today. We'll come back uh, if uh, once we get through that process. So if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next item. Thanks, Catherine. And I'll turn it over to Emily Basham to lead this. Thanks, Mackie. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, this is Emily Basham. I'm a senior manager at the Green Bank. Um, and we are seeking board approval to continue grant support for our partners at Sustainable CT for $125,000 on the basis of strategic selection. Uh, so we can continue to engage communities working on their sustainability and build awareness of our Green Bank programs. Uh, just as a reminder, Sustainable CT is the primary platform supporting Connecticut's towns and cities become more sustainable through a voluntary certification program. Since they launched, 129 of our 169 towns have registered to participate in the program and 66 towns are certified through the program. And through our partnership work, uh, Sustainable CT has incorporated many of our Green Bank programs directly into those actions. Um, so we've got a strong history of partnership with Sustainable CT, um, really beginning with this Green Bank staff um, being involved in setting up the program and continuing to support it um, since its launch in 2018. Thank you. Sustainable CT has become a significant outreach partner um, for us and our community engagement efforts, making a measurable impact on our program activities. You can see on the slide here with their support on our solar map outreach. Um, 51 towns received solar site assessments, resulting in 23 closed Green Bank PPA projects. Uh, for five megawatts of solar. We've run three municipal solar for all campaigns in sustainable CT towns, uh, closing 79 um, residential solar projects. We've um, engaged sustainable CT towns to host webinars and do direct outreach for the CPACE program, and our support has um, funded the Sustainable CT Fellowship Program, uh, providing direct um, support to communities that are working on certification. And through Sustainable CT's Community Match Fund, 
our green bank funds have been matched to fund various projects that fall outside of our programs directly, but are still aligned with our mission, um, including but not limited to the, the three projects listed here on the screen. Uh, so for this fiscal year, we're proposing to renew our grant for $125,000. This continued support would allow the partnership to really capitalize on opportunities that are underway and support uh, program development. We anticipate this support to continue generating awareness um, of and participation in our programs. And we're also looking forward to developing a community-based engagement strategy that includes sustainable CT as a mechanism to uh, solicit municipal feedback as we're planning and building out um, environmental infrastructure, as well as deploying uh, battery storage. So, and we'll continue to use the best practices that we've developed. Uh, for example, the successful engagement in our PPA program through SolarMap has generated interest income from closed PPA projects that uh, cover the cost of this grant. Next slide. So we're proposing this grant on the basis of strategic selection. Sustainable CT has a lot of expertise and experience that is a special capability um, to help us further the Green Bank model. Uh, we've got a unique opportunity to leverage the momentum that we've built over the years and our renewed sort of emphasis on community engagement as we're developing our programs uh, is really, <clears throat> excuse me, put into action with our partnership with Sustainable CT. This would be a follow-on investment to our um, to continue to build on our progress. And timeliness is important here is, you know, renewing this grant will allow us to continue our work, um, engaging communities so that the programs um, that we're relying on aren't sort of interrupted, um, that engagement isn't interrupted. So to close, um, Sustainable CT offers strategic importance to us at the Green Bank to help us increase our impact in communities. And the staff recommend this grant agreement to the board for approval. Anybody have any questions? observations i have to say um some of the folks with sustainable ct are the folks that we bring into municipalities <laughs> have <clears throat> over time to get things done and they they've developed really good working relationships with a lot of municipalities i've been around so i think this is this makes an enormous amount of sense anybody want to move to move this resolution Honey, it's Laura. If it's not a conflict, since I sit on the Sustainable CT Board, I'll move this. Oh, I like it even better now. <laughs> <laughs> Do I hear a second? Second, it's Matt. Thanks, Matt. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Great, okay. And our final financing programs item, uh, discussion around our, our solar map program, which I'll turn it back over to Emily to, to get us started. Thanks, Mackie. <clears throat> So the, the Solar Marketplace Assistance Program for Towns and Cities, uh, we call it Solar Map. It's a newer program of the Green Bank that builds on our, our history of supporting um, municipalities um, being more sustainable and sparking you know, their clean energy activities um, th you know, through programs like Lead by Example and SolarEyes. And through our power purchase agreement, we've financed over 60 municipal solar projects. So we've really seen firsthand the challenges that towns face in getting through sort of the many steps required to 
put together a financeable project. Many Connecticut municipalities, typically the smaller towns, have not shown an ability to get through this process for varying reasons. So we created Solar Map to provide turnkey support from start to finish to just make it easier for towns to identify projects, get the incentives and financing, and um, importantly, really to add much needed capacity to move projects along and implement them and construct them. So the, the key elements of the solar map program are providing no cost technical assistance to do a comprehensive analysis of solar feasibility for all municipal sites. We administer a competitive solicitation to bid the projects out to the market and select an installer partner. And towns that choose to move forward with projects are bundled together into a single portfolio, aggregating their projects. Um, so we can achieve economies of scale and drive down project costs and deliver you know, the savings. So far, we've had three rounds of the program. We've engaged dozens of towns to talk about their sustainability goals and do some feasibility work. Uh, the towns that have moved forward with projects are in the table here on the slide. So in round one, um, that includes 11 projects in four towns, which are under construction currently. Round two includes a 20 projects in nine municipalities that have contracts underway. And the third most recent round are two projects in two towns that have been submitted to the utility incentive program. Overall, the program really comprises a small amount of these incentives. Over 60% of the projects are, are small ZREC projects. So that's sort of an overview of the program itself and sort of the history of why we started the program. Uh, and I'll turn it to Mackie to just talk about some of the contractor feedback that we've gotten so far. Yeah, thanks for that background on the program, Emily. Um, the the reason we're, I, I mean, I think everyone's familiar uh, or at least heard about the, our, our efforts here, uh, but wanted to give that background. And the reason we're talking about it today is because of some pushback or criticism we've received from uh, a subset of the market. Uh, that we wanted to bring to the attention of the board and just make sure that uh, you know we're, everyone is uh, understands that that feedback and and comfortable with with the approach that that we're taking. Um, so we started the program as as Emily said, we saw an opportunity to to benefit a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, many towns were being left behind with solar. They you know they just weren't doing projects. Uh, and not realizing the, you know, the, the environmental and economic benefits of, of solar. Uh, likewise, there were incentive dollars, the, the small ZREC program, uh, that were just not being used. Uh, uh, there were not enough projects to make use of the, the budgets for that, for that sector of the incentive program for years. Um, so, um, there were, the, and uh, so we saw the, the, the projects that could be happening, right? These towns weren't they had, they had roofs that um, were suitable for solar. There was incentives to make them happen. Uh, and we thought contractors, the industry would benefit if we could make projects happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise, because that, you know, that's business that they, they wouldn't have had. And then the Green Bank and our partner IPC would benefit because we're, we're building our balance sheet. So the, you know, the key here was to, to grow the pie, the solar pie in Connecticut, to make projects happen uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And as you, you see from, Emily's presentation. You know, we were seeing success uh, for for two years. Uh, had you know good good rounds. Third round for <laughs> for reasons uh, Tom and I discussed earlier. We we stepped back as well as because of some of this criticism. Um, but the really the nature of the of the criticism it came from a you know I, I characterize a, a small piece of the market. Uh, it was a mix of of types of players. We had a few installers or, or developers. Uh, as well as uh, solar lobbyists and consultants that offered uh, somewhat similar development services to, to towns. And I would characterize their primary issues as, as twofold. Uh, one was around the transparency of the program. 
uh, and second was a, a charge that we were competing directly with the private market um, and really sort of overstepping our bounds as a quasi public uh, and really not being clear about the, the problem we were trying to address and, and who our targets were. Um, you know, both of these are, we take these seriously um, and we're, we're troubled by it. Um, it. It initially came to the Energy and Technology Committee. Um, they, the, their members brought us into the conversation. We met with this group, uh, heard them out, um, and I, we took the, the following approach to, to deal with, with these issues. So on the transparency front, uh, we uh, we've committed to you know, being more transparent with these projects than would be if they were happening outside of the program. So we're talking with the with the group that brought these concerns. Uh, we've identified data points that we'll we'll just or we'll post on our website. You know things like the the, the cost that we contracted with the installers to build the projects, the PPA rates, the incentive rates, uh, the development fees. You know we'll we'll make all this public. Um, we, we always you know, strive to be a transparent organization and um, you know, we, we, so for us that's easy. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll get those out. The second one, uh, this sort of competition and lack of clarity, uh, you know, it's something that we were mindful of from the beginning. Uh, we didn't want to you know, take a piece of the existing pie. Uh, the point was to Again, as I said, to grow the pie, to make projects happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So to, to test whether we were achieving that goal, uh, we, we, you know, we, we talked to the, the, the disgruntled uh, group, but we also wanted to survey you know, other parts of the market. So we went and talked to several towns as well as uh, other installers. So Emily, can you, I know we're sort of running a little long here, could you sort of quickly give a summary of the, the town conversation? Yeah, we, we talked with a handful of municipalities that sort of had varying participation in the program, as Mackie mentioned, many of them citing that they really have challenges doing clean energy projects because they have very small staff with no capacity to take on project feasibility or the procurement work and doing the, these projects just puts a lot of time and involvement from staff that's not sustainable for them. So it's very challenging. Um, and they also have a challenging time getting buy-in from various town boards, even when the projects are proposed internally. Um, and the towns we spoke with felt that it, the solar map program was really helpful to have you know, a turnkey program that helped them get started, provide the ongoing support and identify really the best projects to um, take action on. Um, with a couple, you know, a few of our towns saying we, we wouldn't have support uh, explored solar on our town buildings or gotten as far as we did without the program. So that was helpful feedback for us. Yeah, I mean, I think that was, that was the key. Like we, we heard, you know, there are various reasons Emily outlined also that, you know, they, they trusted us and wanted to work with us. Uh, but, you know, what came through was that, that yes, these, they, you know, they'd had the opportunity, certainly they'd, they'd heard about and <laughs> been pitched solar over the last 10 years, but, uh, for various reasons, had moved forward, but this program allowed them to. And we talked to some installers that we were working with, you know, arguably biased, uh, those that won the projects, but, you know, they validated that these were not projects that they would have been able to get on their own or they would have pursued given many of the small size of many of them. It was this sort of us acquiring the customer and bundling together that allowed the, them to, to do it. Um, so, you know, Given all these conversations, but still, you know, recognizing we the the criticism, we we believe that the you know the program fits you know what the Green Bank should be doing. We should look at the new mission statement we adopted. We are accelerate we're accelerate increasing and accelerated investment, uh, you know, creating project opportunities here, uh, and we're working with with communities that have been sort of left behind uh, with the solar. Um, so it created a more equitable uh, solar just, uh, around the state. Um, so you know we we think the the program makes sense to continue uh, in terms of making clear on what we're trying to do. It's you know we're focused on uh, towns that haven't gone solar. So we'll you know we will limit our any outreach uh, to towns that haven't gone solar in the last uh, at least 
two years. Uh, and what we're focusing on towns with arguably less resources, uh, smaller towns. So we'll limit our outreach to towns of, of populations of 40,000 or less. Uh, not to say we would turn down anyone that approached us and asked for help, but in terms of who we're proactively reaching out to, we would we would limit it. Um, so I'll I'll stop there. I apologize. We've run a little long here, but uh, the I, at least the the ask here to the board is a. Uh, uh, a resolution that you know really it confirms our, our role in the market that this is an appropriate one um, and, and charges us to continue working with uh, communities around the around the state to, to help them go solar. Lonnie, it's Laura. I'll make that motion. Thank you. I'll second it. I have to say <clears throat> it's great to have you making that motion because I think you and I've lived it, and you're living it now. Yes, and, we to, have. <laughs> and to see how how we've reached out, how our people have reached out to uh, to to the pushback boys um, is really important. And they're asking for input, and they're asking um, you know to partner if they can. And and it's demand driven. We know municipalities uh, they're turning to the green bank. We're not you know we're we're not we're not. Uh, I'm glad that we're reaching out to these smaller communities now, but but this is not something that we we did uh, without you know being demand driven. So, uh, any second? Does somebody second? This this is Matt. I'll, I'll, I'll second. I'll I'll say I agree with everything that that you've said. This it's important to keep the market in mind and listen to the uh, voices, Mackie, that you guys are hearing. But um, I think it also is important that we recognize part of the market wasn't getting served, and you know we want to drive penetration into that into that market. And also, I will say I think this Green Map product has really uh, been an improvement. Um, not that there aren't things that towns are surprised, but I think it's really created a good template for how to push a project or get a project through the sort of various municipal approvals, um, which sometimes, uh, in my experience, uh, towns and the private sector weren't really aware of. So I think it's been educational. Hopefully, <clears throat> you can strike the right balance, but good program, and I, I agree. Lonnie, if I may make one other statement. Um, yes. Ironically, what the Green Bank and Mackie and Emily are doing um, is what we strive to do with our COGS and regional um, regional towns of working together, volume buying, um, and, and utilizing whatever grants we have to reach as many people as possible. Um, and I, I find it slightly ironic that that initiative um, is being criticized um, by people who have supported that initiative in the past. So I'm really, really glad to see that. I I personally would like to take the, the um, residential number off and let it just be um, whoever wants the program to take advantage of it, because it's not like you're making municipalities do anything, they're coming to you voluntarily. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Great, that was great input, thanks. Madam Mayor. <laughs> Any more observations or questions? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Let's share read. Um, we've got yes. several other uh, presentations, two resolutions. One is quick and one uh, would require some discussion, but I would suggest on agenda item 7A, we just move beyond that item because we have a, submitted a memo describing an update on investments for the year. So if we could just move into agenda item 7B, which is an extension request for the Groton fuel cell. I don't think this will be long. I'll turn it to Bert real quick and we can get to the other one. Good, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you both. Um, yeah, this is uh, uh, getting to be the, the uh, same old 
play that I'm bringing back to the uh, board. Um, unfortunately, just a further delay in terms of documentation, but it is the transaction is moving along at, at Groton uh, on the sub base there with the fuel cell. That the commissioning is expected to be uh, completed uh, the first week of August. It's, it's actively underway. So there's a process that has to go through with the uh, U.S. Navy for acceptance of the, the fuel cell. So great progress there. Uh, in terms of our transaction, the documentation is underway, but uh, it's, a, it's a slow crawl there. Uh, and the banks are currently refreshing their, uh, their credit approvals, which did go uh, stale during uh, this uh, very pregnant pause. So uh, with that, we are asking for a further extension, which uh, the board had, had extended last month to the end of this month. But since we have uh, no board meeting scheduled until October, and this would require board action to, to extend, uh, we're asking for an extension to October 31st with uh, crossing our fingers that uh, by the end of August, uh, we have this wrapped up. So with that, I turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Bert. Uh, do I hear a motion to, or are there any questions or comments? It's the U.S. Uh, Navy, right? <laughs> Lonnie, yeah. I'm going to abstain. It's Matt, um, just because our firm was involved with some of the banks. Uh, as clients. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Any, any other observations or questions? Okay, do I hear a motion to approve Resolution 8? This is Bettina, I'll move it. Thank you, Bettina. Do we hear a second? I'll Matt, second, it's Adrian. Oh. Adrian? Yes. Okay. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And Matt's abstaining. Correct. Okay. Moving on. Okay. And uh, the next one is uh, Cargill Falls. You'll recall that last year uh, the board um, approved a restructuring of this facility. And um, th this is the uh, mill redevelopment project, mixed use, 82 units of housing, very importantly, 34 of those by the Department of Housing, low income restricted, and uh, some commercial space. Uh, we've got two hydroelectric turbines that are in there that are uh, that we're working to complete. Uh, we have um, we'll give you an update on that down below. Uh, but as far as the project is concerned on the residential side, excellent performance. Occupancy is 100 percent. Renewal rates are going a bit higher than the typical 65 to 75 percent. They're running about 75 to 80 percent, which is really good. Uh, solid waiting list, and most of the units are renewing in July and August, and most are expected to uh, to renew. The, um, the the low income restricted are not expected to be changing in terms of their rental. Uh, it looks like the rental for the market base would be put up a bit. Uh, but not uh, so, um, not too materially so. We were thinking maybe in the 5% range, something like that. Uh, so in any case, um, that's all good. So that's, that's keeping up the revenue side. On the, um, on the hydro side, we're, we've been waiting for a permit from DOT. We expect that momentarily. Uh, so because of, of, of all of these delays on the hydro side, we've been short. Uh, the project has been short on revenue, which has caused uh, a shortfall in terms of cash needed to pay the um, uh, make the CPAS payment. So uh, we come to you with a request to uh, uh, have a slight restructuring of that. You can see on the next slide a nice picture of the uh, uh, mill and everything else there. So um, it's just to roll the interest that would be due on July 1 to, um, uh, to 
uh, to, this, to one of the benefit assessment liens. It is of a shorter term. There are two benefit assessment liens. One's going for 35 years, the other for 10 years. We would roll about $255,000 into the second benefit assessment lien, which is the shorter term lien, uh, which is a million dollars in value. So that would go up to about a million two fifty five. So with that, I uh, would appreciate an approval of that uh, so that we can keep this project on track for uh, closure. Any questions, I'll take at this time. Bert, it's Matt. Um, this one's been around a long time, and I know mm -hmm. the amazing amount of effort that's gone into it. Um, but I guess the question is, what, what are the alternatives if, if we don't allow that money to be rolled into the longer term lien and also is there a way to create a different type of uh, something other structure where we could get that two hundred fifty thousand dollars back sort of on a first dollar out basis from or sooner rather than making it part of the long term and does it make a difference yeah we do we do have that in place basically we are getting all the excess cash flow matt to the extent there is any to, uh, to pay down that note. We already have that in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the owner's not getting anything. We're, we're getting all, all excess cash flow. But we have to take care of the, there's a short, there's a shorter term note of about three years that we worked out with Paul Haynes, the uh, contractor who very much stood by this project for, uh, for, for several years. And, uh, and put several millions of dollars of this company's money at risk. And so, um, so we're, he is getting his money out first and then we're right behind that. Okay, I just, uh, I, I guess I also just with this project, I've, I just always wondered why is, why is there not more capital interest from the private sector on it if, if, it, if it is, there's such high demand, but uh, I know we're short of time. I don't well, want to. Well, I think there could be. I think we have to get to the point, Matt, where everything stabilizes. And yes. one key piece to stabilize is to get that hydro fixed and, and complete. Uh, not fixed, but complete. And we expect yeah. to have that complete by August. Once we have that, then we can start to build a history of, of what, this, what this really looks like from a fully working point of view. You can't get much better than 100% occupancy occupancy and uh 100 hydro performance so you know that's that's what we have that's the history we have to build okay thanks this is bettina did i understand you correctly that you missed the july one payment the um the um oh, the, the project will miss uh paying us uh, the July one payment restructuring as an as an interest only oh. on note number one. We, we're the recipient of the payment. We're not making the payment. Okay, so they already missed that. They they will miss that. Yes, they actually have until the end of this month to make it. But that's why we're restructuring this. Now. Got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This, this Any is more Brian. questions or observations? Who's that? This is Brian. J just a point. So, so we lost quorum. Um, we've got five members of the board. We need seven. Um, so we've recorded. My suggestion would be we've recorded the dialogue. Uh, we will work to schedule maybe a 15-minute meeting next week for a vote if that is okay, um, and we'll provide the presentation and the video for those who are unable to um, uh, see or hear or engage in this conversation, if that works. Sorry, Bert, we lost folks there at the end. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah. Okay, if, if, if that works, we'll, um, we'll We'll keep going. We just have a few updates. If folks want to hang on, feel free. If not, uh, 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 you'll see it in the recording, uh, but enjoy the weekend. Uh, just a few <laughs> <laughs> quick other, other business items. Um, just uh, quickly on the hydrogen study task force, uh, you may recall last month we reported on the end of the legislative session 
uh, Special Act 22-8 creates a hydrogen study task force that the Green Bank uh, is chairing. Um, we held our first meeting last Tuesday. Uh, it went very well. Um, we have um, several ex officio members that serve on the uh, task force, uh, including our various state leaders, Deep Pura uh, Yukon, uh, the president of Yukon was on the call. She is a, uh, ironically holds, if Matt is still on the phone, Matt Rinelli, uh, she holds the Connecticut Clean Energy Fund Chair of Sustainability. And she's now the president of Yukon, very big fuel cell advocate. She was very actively engaged in the conversation of the launch, uh, Radenka Merrick. Uh, Joel Reinbold, who serves with the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology, and myself. So we're the five officios. Uh, we we do have um, six uh, appointees so far of Heath Brothers from the AFL-CIO, uh, Frank Reynolds, the president and CEO of Avon Grid, uh, Deganto Chatterjee, who is with Eversource, uh, a system planner, uh, at Catherine Ayers, who is a technology officer with Nell Hydrogen, uh, Mary Nuara from Dominion Energy leads uh, regional policy efforts, and William Smith, the founder of Infinity Fuel Cell. So we're working with our legislative leaders to fill the remaining, I think there are about 10 slots, um, so still digging in there. Uh, but we had a great launch, lots of good energy. Representative Arcani and Senator uh, Fermika were both there, giving the charge to the group. These are both legislative leaders who I'm sure Laura and Lonnie have worked with in the past, and this is their last hurrah they're not running again uh, but they gave the charge to the group so really good positive energy our next meeting is going to be held at UConn on August 9th we've got regular task force meetings scheduled for the second Tuesday of every month from 10 to noon um, and uh, we're hoping uh, we can get folks out uh, next week I think what I'll do after this meeting is just see if uh, board members are interested in doing the, the tour of quantum biopower that we set up for next week uh, if you are really cool uh, uh, project in action that takes food waste, turns it into, uh, through an anaerobic digester pro uh, process into methane gas that is run through a combined heat and power unit producing electricity and waste heat. A really cool example and gives us a really good view forward looking at uh, waste to energy. Um, and uh, I will leave the last item for uh, Chair Reed. Oh, yes. Um, let me make sure. I have this down. Um, so we received notice. I, I got a letter. Um, it was very, very good news. And actually, the kind of news that uh, Tom Flynn and Matt and everybody are, are and, uh, the mayor and everybody are, are eager to hear. Um, our accounting team has been selected to receive a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association of the U.S. and Canada. And um, the, their uh, transparency and oversight have been incredibly commended. And so I just want to mention Jane Murphy and Eric Trago and, and you know the whole team. I know how hard they work. You see Jane in her corner office in <laughs> um, all that they're dealing with and the fact that they're that they've achieved this kind of recognition in a national sense is really good. So congratulations, everybody. And I think that wraps up our business. That's right. So, so it, 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 unless anybody's really desperate to hang around, I'm just going to adjourn this meeting. Have a, <laughs> Have great a good week. weekend, everyone. Good, everybody. Bye. Carol. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.